racist, sexist, Republican, these words are virtually interchangeable, at least according to most professors, journalists, and celebrities. So are they right? The video we're about to watch is Prager U denying the ideological switch between the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. The switch was slow and took time, but most importantly, it happened. All right, let's take a look at this video. Let's take a look at history. The Republican Party was created in 1854. The first Republican Party platform adopted at the party's first national convention in 1856 promised to defeat, quote, those twin relics of barbarism, polygamy and slavery. Those twin relics were spreading into the Western territories. Republicans feared that as those territories became states, polygamy and slavery might become permanent parts of American life. Polygamy, the marriage of one man to multiple women, devalued women and made them a kind of property. Slavery, of course, did the same to blacks, literally. The Republican Party was formed by members of the Whig Party and Democratic Party. The Whig Party was formed in opposition to Democrats and their president, Andrew Jackson. <laughs> Which party likes Andrew Jackson nowadays? The Whigs were protectionists who supported tariffs while wanting the federal government to finance, quote, internal improvements. They also believed in federal banking, attempting to recreate the Bank of the U.S., which had been abolished by President Andrew Jackson. This differed from the Democratic Party, who back then was the party of states' rights. The Republican Party was formed by anti-slavery expansionists and slavery abolitionists of the Whig Party and some Northern Democrats. Abraham Lincoln was a member of the Whig Party before becoming a Republican. In 1855, while considering a possible switch to the Republican Party, he said, quote, I think I am a Whig, but others say there are no Whigs and that I am an abolitionist. I do no more than oppose the extension of slavery, unquote. So the original GOP, the original Republican Party, was a coalition of anti-slavery expansionist Whigs and Northern Democrats and abolitionist Whigs. The Democrats were so opposed to the Republicans and their anti-slavery stance that in 1860, just six weeks after the election of the first Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, South Carolina, a state dominated by Democrats, voted to secede from the Union. The Civil War that followed was the bloodiest war in U.S. history. South Carolina was dominated by Southern Democrats. This is an important distinction that PragerU leaves out because Northern Democrats did not support the Confederacy at all. The Democratic Party had become split over the idea of the expansion of slavery in the mid-1800s. You had Northern Democrats, many of whom were anti-slavery expansionists, not necessarily anti-slavery, and Southern Democrats, who were pro-slavery hardliners. They wanted to expand it all the way to California. This is shown in the 1860 presidential election, where the Democratic Party had two presidential candidates, the hardline pro-slavery Southern Democrat John C. Breckinridge broke away from the Democratic Party, running an independent campaign, because the Democratic Party's nominee was Senator Stephen Douglas, a Northern Democrat who was more 50-50 on slavery, daring to believe that new states such as Kansas and Nebraska should be able to vote on whether to allow slavery or not. Douglas, the Democratic Party's nominee, was a staunch ally of the Union and rallied the party to completely support it as well. Prager U purposefully leaves this out, collectivizing the Democratic Party as all being for the Confederacy because it doesn't fit their narrative. It led to the passage by Republicans of the 13th Amendment, which freed the slaves, the 14th Amendment, which gave them citizenship, and the 15th Amendment, which gave them the vote. In 1870, the first black senator and the first black congressman were sworn in, both Republicans. In fact, every black representative in the House until 1935 was a Republican, and every black senator until 1979 was too. For that matter, the first female member of Congress was a Republican. The first Hispanic governor and senator were Republicans. The first Asian senator 
You get the idea. Things changed a lot after 1935, though. Let's take a look at the House. There have been 28 black Republicans in the House and 117 black Democrats. Before 1935, all six black congressmen that had served were Republicans. And while they might not have supported every Republican Party policy, many of them were former slaves and looked at Lincoln and the GOP as the bringers of their freedom. Rightfully so. However, this started a change in 1929 with the stock market crash with blacks who lived in northern states deciding to join the northern Democrats. This led to many ultimately serving as northern Democrats in the House. Again, it's very important to point out the north-south divide in the Democratic Party. It wasn't until 1973 when Andrew Young, a northern Democrat ideologically, but not physically, who was black, was elected to represent the deep south state of Georgia in the House. Until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Democratic Party held together a very strange coalition. FDR was elected four times, getting the conservative, racist, white Southern vote and the liberal Democrat vote in the North. While FDR didn't get a majority of black voters to vote for him in 1932, his first term as president, this changed as the success of the New Deal started bringing more black voters into the Democratic Party. FDR didn't push to end Jim Crow and segregation, as that would have alienated the important white Southern Democratic vote. This is when the Democratic Party started shifting more towards civil rights, and the divide between Northern and Southern Democrats was growing by the year. Republicans also kept their pledge to defend women's rights. In 1862, the Maria Anti-Bigamy Act was passed by the Republican-controlled Congress to put an end to polygamy. In 1920, after 52 years of Democratic Party opposition, the 19th Amendment was ratified thanks to the Republican Congress, which pressured Democratic President Woodrow Wilson to drop his opposition to women's rights. In the final tally, only 59% of House Democrats and 41% of Senate Democrats supported women's suffrage. That's compared to 91% of House Republicans and 82% of Senate Republicans. This is true, but misleading. Southern Democrats were staunchly against women's suffrage, while Northern Democrats were uninterested in the political risks involved. The beginnings of the 19th Amendment began during the 1912 elections, and this shows you a lot about how the Republican Party was at that point ideologically. And in these elections, the pro-suffrage Progressive Party and Socialist Party garnered a combined 33.4% of the popular vote. Former Republican President Teddy Roosevelt ran a third party campaign in 1912 because of his dislike to William Taft and that was the Progressive Party. He gained 27% of the popular vote. PragerU won't put this fact in their video that there was a huge faction of the Republican Party at that time that were progressives, left-wing progressives. William Taft, the Republican candidate, gained 23% of the vote. This split the Republican vote, thereby handing Woodrow Wilson the victory. The Republican Party of the early 20th century looked a lot like the present-day Democratic Party. You had left-wing progressives like Teddy Roosevelt, who compare to our current day Bernie Sanders, both call themselves progressives, and you had pro-business centrists who at the time were socially liberal, like William Taft, and they compare, of course, to Hillary Clinton, Cory Booker, and other establishment Democrats. There certainly was a war on women, and it was led by the Democratic Party. But while Republicans had won a major battle for women's rights, the fight for black civil rights had a long way to go. In the 1920s, Republican President Calvin Coolidge declared that the rights of blacks are just as sacred as those of any other citizen. By contrast, when famed sprinter Jesse Owens, a staunch Republican, won four gold medals at the 1936 Berlin Olympics, he was snubbed by Democratic President Franklin Roosevelt. Roosevelt only invited white Olympians to the White House. FDR 
made this unhonorable and racist decision regarding Jesse Owens to hold together the fragile Democratic coalition that saw the Democrats dominate for over 10 years. These 10 years of domination brought the New Deal, which began the exodus of blacks from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party because of how these social democratic policies benefited poor black communities. However, Jesse Owens was a staunch Republican for good reason. But this is no excuse to deny the fact that the two parties switched platforms and that Jesse Owens was of the last generation where more black Americans belong to the Republican Party than to the Democratic Party. Two decades later, it was a Republican president, Dwight Eisenhower, who sent the 101st Airborne Division to escort black students into Little Rock Central High when Arkansas Governor Alva Forbes, a Democrat, refused to honor a court order to integrate the state's public schools. The Civil Rights Act of 1960, which outlawed poll taxes and other racist measures meant to keep blacks from voting, was filibustered by 18 Democrats for 125 hours. Not one Republican senator opposed the bill. Its follow-up bill, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, is one of the landmark pieces of legislation in American history. That, too, survived a filibuster by Democrats thanks to overwhelming Republican support. This is the most disingenuous part. When Democratic President Lyndon Johnson signed the Civil Rights Act into law, he said, quote, we, as in the Democrats, have lost the South for a generation, unquote. And he was right. Zero Southern Republicans voted for the Civil Rights Act of 1964, with 10 opposing the bill. But eight Southern Democrats supported the Civil Rights Bill, while 107 opposed it. On the other hand, 190 Northern Democrats voted for it. PragerU conveniently leaves out this vital information. After its passage, Southern Democrats began to be replaced by Republicans, even if they had opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There are many examples of this. Southern Democratic Senator George Smathers of Florida wasn't replaced in 1969 by a Democrat, but rather by Edward Gurney, a Republican. Many of Gurney's voters were supporters of Alabama Governor George Wallace, the famous Southern Democratic racist. As a congressman, Gurney voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. There's more. Southern Democratic Senator Benjamin Jordan was replaced by Republican Jesse Helms in 1972. Jesse Helms staunchly opposed civil rights of any kind. Southern Democratic Senator James Eastland was re-elected after 1964, but was replaced by Republican Thad Cochran in 1978. And the biggest one and most well-known one here is Southern Democrat Strom Thurmond, a senator from South Carolina, became a Republican after he voted against the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Thurmond remained in office after he became a Republican, continuing to oppose civil rights legislation, being elected to office by the people of former Democratic stronghold South Carolina until his Senate career ended in 2003. This was the Southern strategy, turning former Southern Democratic strongholds like South Carolina into deep red states by appealing to their racist, segregationalist nature. Democrat Lyndon Johnson's opponent in the 1964 presidential election was Republican Barry Goldwater, who had been an ardent opponent of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, believing it was an overreach of federal power. Goldwater lost the 1964 election in a landslide, but won the Deep South by a huge margin. How does PragerU not include this? Because it doesn't fit their narrative. Kevin Phillips, Richard Nixon's political strategist, said this about the GOP's strategy to gain white Southern voters. Quote, From now on, the Republicans are never going to get more than 10 to 20 percent of the Negro vote, and they don't need any more of that. But Republicans would be short-sighted if they weakened enforcement of the Voting Rights Act. 
the more Negroes who register as Democrats in the South, the more the Negrophobe whites will quit the Democrats and become Republicans. That's where the votes are. Without that prodding from the blacks, the whites will backslide into their old comfortable arrangement with the local Democrats." Unquote. After anti-civil rights Goldwater was the GOP's nominee, blacks started joining the Democratic Party in large numbers. I, I wonder why, with people like Strom Thurmond switching to what they thought was a pro-civil rights Republican Party. This only made Southern Democrats more angry. The trend of white Southerners refusing to vote for the Democratic Party continued. In 1968, Alabama governor and former Southern Democrat George Wallace, an ardent pro-segregationalist and Jim Crow supporter, made a third-party run as a Dixiecrat, winning the South by huge margins. And in 1972, Richard Nixon won the South by huge margins. The Republican Party's Southern strategy had been a massive success. It was at this point that many blacks in the South became staunch Democrats. Democrat Andrew Young was then elected to represent Georgia's 5th District in 1973, becoming the first black Democratic congressman in a Deep South state. Many more have followed him. But you might be thinking, all oh, that's in the past. What have Republicans done for women and blacks lately? The answer you'd hear from professors, journalists, and celebrities is not much. And this time they'd be right. They'd be right because the Republican Party treats blacks and women as it treats everyone, as equals. The Democratic Party never has, and it still doesn't. Today's Democrats treat blacks and women as victims who aren't capable of succeeding on their own. The truth is, this is just a new kind of contempt. So there is a party with a long history of racism and sexism, but it ain't the Republicans. It's time for PragerU to stop whitewashing history so that their group, the right-wing conservatives, look perfect. Do they really believe that the South was at one point full of big government, racist, left-wing Democrats? And as the South became less racist, the Republican Party grew? I say no. This ignores the facts. Facts trump ideology. Just like fascism isn't left-wing, but in fact right-wing. Just like the alt-right isn't left-wing, but right-wing. Just like Hitler was a right-winger and not a left-winger. Segregation might be illegal, but it's still prevalent in the United States. How could things really change in South Carolina, for example, if an anti-civil rights guy like Strom Thurmond served as its senator as late as 2003. The truth is, the Republican Party became the party that peddles the anti-civil rights, pro-segregationalist line after the Democrats passed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. They did this to grow and take power in the South after seeing men like George Wallace begin to hate their own party, the Democrats. The party switched platforms. The party currently headed by Trump is nowhere near being the party that was originally headed by Abraham Lincoln.